So I thought <coughs> we'll define what is what is palliative care. Okay, the definition of palliative care. Palliative stands for the word to cloak, to cover, or to improve. To improve something. Okay. So one definition of palliative care is a treatment to prevent, reduce or relieve the sim symptoms of disease without affecting cure. Meaning, this is care that's given once the doctor has said, well, sorry, like your chemotherapy hasn't worked anymore, your, your radiation's not working anymore, the, the disease continues to progress, and uh, there's not much else we can do, surgery is kind of too late. So this is where palliative care comes in. Next one, it's offered along with, along with curative treatments throughout the course of an illness and at the end of life. So it's not only given at the end of life, but supposedly, in the ideal way, it's given along with curative treatment. So even while the surgeon, the chemotherapist, the oncologist gives the radiation, chemotherapy, ideally, palliative care physicians should be included in there, ideally, okay? And the third one is includes both medical and psychosocial interventions. So I won't cover very much medical. You've had the uh, talks already this morning, but I'll cover a lot more. What the hell do we mean by psychosocial interventions? Okay, so let's look at these definitions in turn. <coughs> so if this is a diagram of a person's life where the diagnosis of the cancer, breast cancer, happens. Often, as you know, the curative, the chemotherapy, radiation, and all that starts. Ideally, palliative care starts coming in even before the end. Ideally. Okay? But as, more, as the disease progresses, more, less and less of the curative interventions occur, and more and more of the palliative care interventions occur until the point of death. And ideally, even after death, bereavement support continues to happen to the surviving family, spouses and children. Okay? So this is a conceptual diagnosis of how palliative care starts. So let's have a look at the definition one by one in turn. Okay? The first one, as I mentioned, palliative care treatment to prevent, reduce. So how does it prevent? Well, Palliative care can prevent, for example, constipation. Many of the medications can make you constipated as you're not eating too well, dehydration and so on. Improving their nutrition, diet and so on. S stiffness as you get chemotherapy, you don't want your joints starting to hurt. How to prevent stiffness from happening. How to prevent loneliness from happening, for example. So as uh, Erica mentioned, Loneliness, loneliness, not just personal loneliness, but like your husband upon abandoning you, abandoning you, or if it's a, if it's a male, the, the woman or the family or children might be abandoning. So how do palliative care people intervene? Well, we may be able to talk to the family by saying, hey, look, you know, these and these and these are things happening. Can we have a conversation? Okay. We can try to prevent infections as the wound becomes ulcerating, ulcerates, okay? Uh, how to do wound dressing? How to prevent infections from developing? How to prevent flies from going on there and developing maggots, for example, okay? Uh, how to prevent paralysis? Well, as you know, one of the things cancer does is it metastasizes. It spreads to other areas. One of the areas that can spread, of course, is your nervous system. And if it invades the spinal cord, it can cause paralysis. So how can we prevent? By detecting early signs and symptoms of early paralysis so we can intervene. For example, if somebody starts showing signs and symptoms of cord paralysis, we can immediately call the radiation oncologist and say, hey, uh, oncologist, I think the, the metastasis where we literally don't send people to the emergency department we literally call the oncologist, the radiation oncologist, and say, look, guy, this is what I have, this is, I expect. can you see him, him or her this afternoon, or at least tomorrow morning? Not next week or two, by that time it's too late, okay? Because if you can prevent paralysis, 
It prevents so many other things. Prevent gland infections, prevent pressure sores. Once a person's paralyzed, boy, the, usually the course of decline is dramatic. Usually, in three months' time, the person is dead. Not because of the disease, but because of all the complications of paralysis, like infections and so on. Okay? So, that's number one, the prevention. How does paralysis healthcare reduce symptoms of disease? Well, we can reduce pain and breakthrough pain. What is breakthrough pain? Well, pain is you have pain. When you have pain, you go to the doctor, you get pain medication. But what happened in between the dosages? Like, for example, the doctor says, please take this pain medication every eight hours. Well, what happened if the pain starts coming up at five hours, six hours, seven hours before the next dose? Uh, that's what we call breakthrough pain. So we can help intervene how to manage with this situation called breakthrough pain. Of course, radiation can cause nausea, vomiting, as Erica mentioned. Well, we can help reduce by giving anti-nausea drugs, for example. Um, somebody has lung cancer, for example, may have a lot of phlegm, a lot of secretions. We can give medications that will redu reduce the secretions. Okay. Uh, false smiling odors, wounds that is getting infected. Oh yeah, it's very stinky. Lah. Simple things like open the window, put a fan on, let the fan blow the air, the stinky air out of the window. One simple thing, which sometimes people don't think about. Another way is you can put charcoal on the wood. Charcoal will absorb the odors. Okay, After it absorbs, then you can wash it off. Then it doesn't smell so bad. So simple things, that's not so-called doctor things, more nursing things, but even sometimes nurses and doctors don't think about it. So that's where we can help. Wound discharge, how to reduce wound discharge? There may be a lot of discharge coming up. Well, good old uh, uh, rice powder or taco powder can reduce the, the amount of discharge. So simple things we can use, okay? The third one. How can palliative care relief? Well, pain obviously, by giving pain medications. And the reason I'm not going to dwell too much on pain, although the topics on pain, any doctor should know how to treat pain. Now. Pain is the most common symptom that patients will go to the doctor. Okay? So just to briefly cover that is we in the in palliative care we teach people how to use the WHO World Health Organization the pain ladder. And the pain ladder classically has three steps. Step one is you start with this mildest kind of analgesics like aspirin, Panadol, with anything else to, to help. Level two is the mild opioid, like Tramadol and so on. And then level three is the strong opioids, like the morphine and so on. In some countries, there is a level four and level five as well. Level four is where they use more stronger things like that morphine, like ketamine and so on. And level five is where you use interventional analgesia like uh, cord transaction, uh, radiation to burn uh, per certain pathways and so on. So the classical WHO pain ladder has three levels, but in other countries, depending how advanced they are, they've added the fourth and the fifth ladder, so to say. Okay? So, we can help relieve pressure sores. So we would teach the family, say the, the father or the mother, how, how often to turn the patient, how to move the patient, and this is where the nurse come in, where they can teach how to shift the patient without attacking your back, okay? Um, explain on the fear of the unknown. So what happens if the breast cancer continues to grow? Huh? Well, if you ask the, the husband, Children, they would know, they've never had experience. But you can see, well, what can happen is so and so. Okay? Uh, so by explaining the unexpected, the unknown, sometimes it can relieve a lot of the fear. Um, an example, for example, lung cancer or nasopharyngeal cancer, like uh, Prof. Chong said. Nasopharyngeal cancer, we know what, what are the causes. For example, if the nasopharyngeal cancer is close to the carotid artery, a. Carotid artery is a big artery to the brain. Line. 
But what happens if the, the, the cancer starts eroding into the carotid artery? Can the carotid artery burst? Yes, it can. So by explaining to the patients and the patient family by saying, look, uh, it's, when that happens, be prepared that it can be messy. Okay. So what can we do? Well, prepare buy some red towels. Why red towels, not green towels or white towels? Because if you have a white towel and it bursts, white red on white looks very dramatic. But a red towel with red blood, it doesn't look so bad. Okay. Uh, so when that happens, what else can you do? Well, just be there with your husband. Because even if you call the ambulance, by the time the ambulance th comes, or by the time you call the doctor, probably things are over already. So best thing to do is know it may happen. If it happens, be prepared. One of the things you can do, for example, is let's talk to the patient and say, if it happens, anything else you would like to do? One young gentleman said, yeah, when it happens, I want to celebrate how I die. How do you plan to do that? Press the, the tape machine and have my bolero music going full blast while I die. Wow. So he felt in control. Okay? While the family also felt like, hey, now they can do something rather than not knowing what could happen. Okay? Or lung cancer. Close to the bronchi. Can can the lung cancer erode into the bronchi and then produce and bleed into the bronchi. If you suddenly have a lot of blood in the bronchi, then what happens? You vomit blood. Ah, so what can you do? So explaining what could happen and what they could do oftentimes help a lot, a huge lot, to relieve anxiety and fear.